It's my pleasure to welcome today to Google uh, Dr. Cliff Click. He's the chief JVM architect at Azul Systems. He's one of the lead architect. He was the lead, the lead architect on Hotspot Server Compiler back in the days when he used to work at Sun. Uh, and he's here today to talk to us about uh, Azul's experience with lots and lots of cores and hardware software co-design. Uh, so here he is. Thanks. Hi. Um, so as you can probably tell from the slides, uh, you're getting recycled slides from eCoop. Um, uh, eCoop uh, uh, keynote, but uh, I think they're very interesting. It's a very interesting talk here. So, um, so a quick look at what Azul is and what we do uh, and sort of what we've done. Um, we design our own chips. Uh, they're actually fabbed by a uh, Taiwan silicon manufacturing company. Um, we build our own systems out of those chips. We target the systems for running business Java. We have a very large core count, like 54 cores per die. We can make up to 16 of the die cache coherent, so the big box has 864 cores in it. We have a very weak memory model, um, but it meets the Java spec when we put in the right set of memory fences. Um, the memory speed is flat. It's uh, uniform. It is not NUMA, which you usually expect out of a high core count machine. And that's because business Java is very irregular computation. So there's a no sane layout you can do where you can get some of your memory, uh, you know, the, the local memory close to you, or, or pick some chunk of memory you know is going to be local. Um, and uh, instead, we just gave up on that and said, OK, it's all medium speed. There's no fast, no slow. Uh, we do have a lot of bandwidth. We hit the, we're still on the top 20 list for supercomputer bandwidth um, a couple of years later. The CPUs themselves have a fairly uh, modest per CPU caches, uh, but in aggregate, there's a lot of cache on the die, um, 16K I cache and D cache each, uh, times 54 cores. And, uh, and then every set of nine cores share a 2 meg L2. There's six of those on the die, so there's 12 megs of L2. It's, uh, in aggregate, there's a lot of cache on the die. Let's see if this goes. There it goes. And I went too fast, too far. Let me back up here. Yeah, OK. So. Um, I, I, I didn't, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what button I pressed that made it go there. Fine, okay. So the cores are classic three address risks. They're very simple. Um, they clock slower than an x86. Um, a part of that's just because there's a lot less area consumed for cores, no replication of parts. Everything has to go through a very simple pipe. Um, we can sustain a couple of cache missing ops on each core. Uh, and each L2 can sustain a number of prefetches. So uh, an aggregate across the entire box, you can have well over 2,000 outstanding memory references in flight at once. Uh, and that's not hard to achieve on the box, and that's pretty common. And that will not cause anyone to slow down. We have bandwidth to spare to do that. We have hardware transactional memory support, a bunch of special ops to make Java's life better, including read and write barriers for GC, um, a bunch of other things that are all sort of nickel and dime chains to make Java run faster. And we're really, we're targeting thread level parallelism uh, in a managed runtime kind of system. That's sort of the goal target there. Yeah. So uh, when we look back in time when Azul was started, um, the, the Java was replacing COBOL. A lot of that came out of sort of the Y2K driving um, People realized at the time of the Y2K you know, non-disaster that uh, they had to replace all their COBOL code, and their COBOL programmers were literally dying of old age. So these big businesses decided to flip to Java. I don't know why, uh, and, but they did. And suddenly, there was millions and millions of lines of Java code being written on an you know, annual basis. And a lot of it had thread-level parallelism built into it, application servers. Uh, Beans, uh, you know, WebLogic, WebSphere, JBoss, those kind of things. So it's all task level, transaction level parallelism, thread pools, work lists, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and you know, in conjunction with that, people are hitting the power wall. You can't add more power. You can't clock faster because that consumes more power. More power in your chip melts. So clock frequencies are topping out. People are predicting they're going to have more transistors. There's no point in adding more cache. You can't clock faster, so you're going to get more cores. And we fast forward 2009, and in fact, clock rates have stalled. The gamers get 3.5 gigahertz. The cheaper guys get 2.5 gigahertz. But everyone's got four cores. That's sort of a lower bound now. You can't get less. Um, so the obvious synergy between where we were back then and what was obviously coming is to run all these transactions on separate cores. So you want to have a multi-threaded, multi-core machine. right? So that was what we were thinking when we started designing the box. But then we had to look at it and say, well, really, who buys custom hardware? Hardware. You must have like a really, really good reason to buy custom hardware or the obvious x86 solution. And, you know, a merely you know, 5x price performance kind of gain is not really good enough to make people jump ship there. So you had to do something very special. So what else can we do besides more cores? Um, 
Well, uh, big business apps were already pushing memory limits of what you could squeeze into a box. So that was the whole 32-bit versus 64-bit heap. So we said, okay, we're just going to jump straight to 64-bit heaps, not bother with 32 bits. Right? We're going to have lots of thread support, lots of thread count support. Um, GC, what can we do in GC? Well, the notion of using read barriers for GC has been around for like over 20 years. You look like the old symbolic skies. Um, they did this kind of game long, long, long ago. And so we said, okay, we can do this in hardware. It's a tiny bit of extra hardware. Um, we also asked you, can we have the extra tag bit in hardware to have pointers in hardware as a tag thing? And the hardware guys jumped up down right away and said, no, 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 no. Must have commodity DRAMs. Must be 64-bit DRAMs. Cannot have a, fifth, a 65th bit there. Okay, fine. Um, transactional memory is a hot topic. Uh, hardware support for transactional memory is a hot topic. It was all over the academic literature. It was going to save us from our complex locking schemes. We all know that complex locking schemes are a big problem. We don't know how they work. Uh, nobody understands where they miss the atomics, so they throw synchronized keywords everywhere in an effort to save themselves. Um, no one wants to actually rewrite all their applications using some sort of new language construct until there's like an obvious, it's obviously going to work and there's an obvious uh, momentum of people in the community producing both the programs and the implementations. So that hasn't happened. This is still an open research problem, how to implement this guy. So instead, we're using hardware transactional memory to support lock elision done in a combination of hardware and software. So Java lock elision. That's what we're aiming for, that hardware. A um, couple other things we can do. We know that locking is going to be an issue, but most locks are not contended. That's like a 99% case. So uh, you need a, an atomic operation, a CAS, to go uh, take a lock in the first place, but usually it's never contended. So we wanted the uncontended CAS to be fast, so we arranged our hardware memory model such that an uncontended CAS can hit in your L1 cache, and it runs at an L1 cache speed. So... CAS can hit and cache. It's a one-clock pipeline. Same thing for a memory fence. If you don't have any outstanding memory references that aren't going to be resolvable and there's no contention for memory, uh, you can do a memory fence, a proper Java memory model ordering, and a clock pipeline. Right? Turns out that uh, CAS, as implemented by every other CPU on the planet, includes a memory fence, and that memory fence is not in the correct spot for how uh, Hotspot does locks. So Hotspot emits a second fence on top of the CAS as part of the standard cost of taking a Java lock kind of a painful thing. So we have a no-fence CAS. And we turned out we found a bunch of other interesting use cases for this atomic updated performance counters, a bunch of lock-free algorithms which don't need ordering. So we use this no-fence CAS all over the place, and it makes us uh, sort of run faster in this highly contended, highly concurrent code. We do have fences to perforce ordering when we need it. Uh, there's not otherwise much ordering. It's a much weaker memory model than, say, uh, x86s or Sparks TSO. Um, <coughs> We, we allow all kinds of reordings that these other memory models don't allow, and we rely on fences to get the answer correct, for which the JIT run running Java code obviously does the right thing, and so you get the Java memory model. Okay. Um, so we've had hardware transactional memory support in from day one. Um, that's a little bit of talk about what goes on with this. Um, there are extra opcodes, the speculate, commit, and abort opcodes, uh, and there's extra tag bits in your L1 cache. And there's nothing at all in your L2 about how the HTM works. The hardware guys are very clear on that. You cannot, the, H, the L2 is uh, what Intel calls the LLC, the last level cache. It's the point of coherency between the hundreds and hundreds of CPUs in the system. That is already one of the most complicated parts of the system. There's no freaking way you're going to go in there and add some new weird ass thing that no one knows if it's going to help or not. So nothing in the L2 on hardware transactional memory. It's all done in the L1 level. So when you start and end a transaction, um, whether it succeeds or it fails or whatever it does, the L2 is utterly unaware that you're doing this, right? Okay, so you have extra tag bits in your L1. You turn on the speculate mode with the speculate opcode. Uh, every time you do a read or write, it tests, uh, sets a little bit in the L1 cache saying this line has been read speculatively or written speculatively. And then if you ever lose a line, one of these tagged lines out of your L1, for whatever reason, uh, you abort. And if you abort, you lose them all. We just take all the spec lines and throw them out of the cache. So all those writes you accumulated in your you know, L1 cache, they all get thrown out. Uh, and then you go to a software recovery mechanism, which uh, essentially decides to retry the transaction or switch to heavyweight lock or do something, whatever, do whatever it's going to do to recover the situation. Since you're doing Java level locking, it's entirely plausible to do software recovery where you just retry the lock a few times and see if you can't get the transaction to float through. Um, we routinely see transactions on the order of thousands of instructions long, um, and it turns out that this is not helpful in practice. I have another talk on why HTM isn't going to save the world. 
But the short answer is there's no dusty deck speed up from lock elision. We elid uh, dozens of locks in these big concurrent programs, but never the ones that allow actually more threads to run concurrently. Right? And usually because they have a true data dependency, and the true data dependency prevents all kinds of transactional memory, hardware, software, whatever you're going to do. You have a true data dependency. And usually that true data dependency is due to something stupid like a performance counter that no one's looking at. But you add one to a shared counter, it's a true data dependency, and you're stuck. You just can't make that transact. So someone has to hack the code. As soon as someone's willing to hack the code, by the way, then all bets are off. Why hack your code to make it transactional memory friendly when you could hack it to be fine grain locking friendly? Absolutely. It, yeah, already done. It's in high scale lib. <laughs> and it turns out that in practice, when we get to these high CPU counts, big box systems, what prevents scaling is GC. It's not locking. People write, uh, they have GC issues that, that they, they uh, consume more memory or have a large enough heap that they have GC pause times that prevent them from, from trying to make a bigger system because the pauses are killing them as it is. So instead they cluster smaller JVMs, right? Oh yeah, contrast this to Sun Niagara Rock product. Um, we do not abort for function calls or TLB misses or nested locks or a thousand other things that Rock does. We have a much stronger implementation than Sun's Rock processor, much weaker than most academic paper presentations that never see the light of day, um, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's not going to save the world. Okay, what other things are going on here? This is time. This, think back to 2000, 2002. We're designing a system. Okay, the multi-core obvious risk uh, is you're going to run out of bandwidth because each one of these CPUs is going to have its own, um, you know, uh, working set of memory it's going to touch, its own set of cache misses. It's got these relatively small caches. It's going to need to go to memory a lot. You're going to run out of bandwidth, right? You're going to have 54 cores. You're going to have 54 as much bandwidth requirement. Well, not quite. But something like that. So it turns out that we have a bunch of things we can do. We did uh, 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 what we call a CLZ instruction, the just-in-time zeroing in your L1 cache. It's support for streaming uh, memory allocation. turns out that if you look at how uh, standard garbage collectors do allocation, it's this very efficient bump pointer style allocation. But that also means that you're constantly moving to new addresses that have never been seen by this CPU since the last full GC cycle. So long ago, those addresses all left your cache. So it's a constant stream of cache misses. You promptly zero that memory by writing it entirely, and then you fill it with good data and use it for a while, and then most of it dies young in your cache because the generational assumption works and most objects die young. Okay, fine. But what it means is you read a bunch of stuff from memory in order to touch this new cache line that you promptly zero, so you didn't actually need to do the read. You don't want that data. You're going to fill it with zeros. You just want coherence. So we have this just-in-time zeroing, which zeroes the line in the cache, without actually reading memory, lowers your read bandwidth. Turns out that that, in practice, very measurable, very real, 30% reduction in bandwidth. That's a big ticket pile of bandwidth reduction. Um, we have stack allocation support, which is essentially escape detection as opposed to, there's a lot of literature about escape analysis. This is much more effective. Um, when you do escape detection, you can optimistically assume objects have stacked lifetimes, uh, and you're almost always right. And when you're right, the, you don't have to read the da data, but you don't have to write it either. It stays in your cache, and you recycle the same memory in your cache, and it cuts both the read and the write traffic out. So that's another nice win on bandwidth. Um, we have this very loose memory model, uh, which lets us scale to big core counts, lets things go out of order. It's a one way to, you still have the bandwidth issue, but you can, um, you get more time to cover the bandwidth, more hardware opportunities to reorder things to cover the bandwidth. Can you call it the distinction between escape detection and analysis? So in escape analysis, you do a, a conservative uh, uh, analysis on the lifetime of an object. And if you can prove it has this nice stack lifetime, then there's an obvious allocation technique where you allocate it on your stack, and when your function exits, it's deallocated. So it's free to allocate, free to deallocate, right? Great. Um, but to do so, you have to prove that it doesn't escape your analysis border. And in small programs, small to modest, that kind of analysis technique turns out to work out fairly well. There's a bunch of interesting benchmarks. We get this giant gain. You don't go to your cache. You quit doing GC cycles. Every, I mean, you quit leaving your cache. You quit doing GC cycles. Everything runs hot in your cache. It's great. For the bigger programs, the analysis gets ever more conservative because the program just gets too big to do the whole analysis. And it turns out that you know, IBM did it on these nice big app servers, the ones where the people pay real money for real hardware. 
Um, those programs get so conservative so quickly that they get nothing out of escape analysis. It just, they can't prove anything remains live for a short duration. So escape detection, on the other hand, says, um, let's make this thing like as if it's going to have stack lifetime, but every time you do a store which might escape a pointer out of your purvey, test to see if it's really escaping uh, out of the stack lifetime. So it's totally optimistic. It's totally fix it up after the fact if something goes wrong. There's no pre-analysis. Uh, and it turns out in practice, uh, for these big app servers, we can get between 60 to 70 percent of all objects uh, stack allocated, whereas the good escape analyses are like well under 20, 30 percent. They're like down in the noise kind of range. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big difference. Um, yeah, OK. So yeah, well, I have a nice big talk on how that is and why it works and why it's useful. Too much in this talk already. OK, so other things we play here. Uh, supports for lots of cache misses. I mentioned that before. Similar to sort of the Niagara model, instead of having one uber fast core, you have lots and lots of cores that each independently are spewing out cache misses. And then all those cache accesses or uh, misses are all coming back in parallel. And so you get a big bandwidth uh, to memory effectively out of it. Uh, but you have to do it by having all these different threads that are all running in their own little direction, right? So the goal is throughput. It's not single-threaded performance. And we really built a throughput machine. We have lots of memory controllers. There's four per chip. We stripe the memory accesses across all the chips so you don't hotspot any individual memory controller. So if you're you know, successively accessing uh, addresses in memory uh, in, in actual hardware implementation, those will go to all the different memory controllers uh, in a hashed, uh, semi-random fashion. And, and, and then come back to you. So the one chip will light up all your memory controllers. Uh, and, and so all the chips, in turn, will take you know, their time, their, their turn, lighting up all the memory controllers. So it really spreads the effort of going to memory out. Uh, so that avoids hot spots and lets you use all the bandwidth you have. Uh, and you know, one of the observations here is that there is no sane memory layout of, of local and remote, of I'm going to use all of this chunk of memory and none of that chunk, so move this chunk close to me. You can't do that in business logic Java. There's no sane memory layout. Since there's no sane layout, if it's just random, then you know, 15 sixteenths of your memory is on the other memory controls on the other chip, right? It's remote. So then if you speed up the local case, you sped up the one sixteenth case and like what's the point of that? So at that point we gave it up and just said uh, even local memory is just loop back off the chip, come back on, same cost as going remote. Um, but there's no gain either. Uh, no gain, no loss. It's the same cost. Uh, it turns out there are other uses where you want caches. They work great for your stacks, for your young new gen objects, a couple other cases where you want a cache. And for everything else, we just threw bandwidth at it. All right, what else can we do? Um, short cache lines to avoid false sharing. It's another bandwidth saver. We have these nice short cache lines. Also allows more concurrency because it avoids some false sharing issues. Support for faster virtual calls. Um, we went ahead and put metadata uh, in the pointer. So we have a 64-bit pointer. Um, we threw an extra few bits. Like no, everyone else on the planet implements the, six, the only like the lower 40, 42 addressing bits. That's already a couple terabytes of memory. The upper 20 bits, they just either have all zeros or all ones. We said, well, we'll put some data in those bits, right? And the hardware will strip them out when it goes out to the address buses. But we got data in the pointers, and the metadata in the pointers. We got some in for the garbage collection. I'll talk some about that in a minute. Um, but we can also use it to speed up virtual calls because those have to do a predicted subclass test and we can put the class of an object in the header and do the test straight on the object pointer itself, not off the contents of the pointer, right? Bunch of little stuff. Um, cooperative self-suspension is actually kind of a big ticket item. Um, we're going to save point thousands of runnable threads, not just thousands of threads where most are blocked in I.O. Thousands of running threads have to come to a safe point and allow GC. So we have some cooperative self-suspension mechanism where we can halt thousands of running threads in milliseconds and get them to all agree that we're all stopped uh, or start our conversely all started again. Okay. So I had a lot of fun conversations through the years with the guys, the Harbor guys, on, on how to do all this kind of stuff, right? And so routinely I had, you know, especially when I started here, um, I had games where I'd play like, gosh, I really wish I had an instruction that did X, whatever X was. And I'd go to the hardware guy and say, can you give me an instruction to do this? He'd say, sure, I'll give you one. It did about three clocks, and here are three one-clock instructions that do X. And now the hardware guy says, you know, and now tell me why it really has to be faster than three clocks. Is it so fast? Is it so common? Is it so whatever? Do you need to beat three clocks? And I'd have to come back and say, well, you know, no, I don't really need it faster than three clocks. It comes around every few thousand instructions, so one, two, or three, you know, no big deal. So out of that came this really clean architecture where I, I didn't get what I wanted a lot of the time. Um, but I got a simple chip, which is easy to use. 
And in exchange, I got comments back from them like, we can do these really cool things in hardware, like directly execute bytecodes. You know, the old, uh, I don't know, uh, MIPS, was it MIPS guys who did it? Jython? No, Jezel. One of these Pico Java thingies. And I was like, oh my god, don't do that. It's been tried before, it's disastrous. We're going to JIT. Give me a nice JIT target. Nice three address risk. I'll, I'll make you pretty code for it. And it'll run really fast. Don't try and screw around with executing bytecodes directly because after I JIT, you won't care for it. And in any case, you can't handle all the bytecodes, so you'll have to bail out the software all over anyhow. So we can put in fancy branch target buffers to speed up virtual calls. And again, I was like, you know, if I look at the instruction traces, the number of times I do a jump register is like next to none because we got these nice things called inline caches. So we don't do direct register jumps. Instead, we do inline caches almost everywhere. And all I want is standard branch prediction hardware. Don't get me anything fancy. Basic stuff's more important to get right. I'd rather have a 5% bump in clock rate over any one of these other things. So it's kind of fun games going back and forth. Really, the core design philosophy boiled down to what can we do easier in hardware than in software and vice versa, right? So in hardware, it's easy to detect interestingly bad situations, such as cache lines getting kicked out for your hardware transactional memory. You lost the line out of your cache. That's really hard to do in software. People who write software transactional memory systems doing roughly the same kind of thing see a 10x slowdown to do it all in software. It's a tough thing to do in software. Hardware can do it for free. They have to do it anyhow. That's part of their cache coherency protocol. So it was just like a freebie from them. How about cache line zero? Um, we don't have it. Ours does not uh, order with the standard memory fences because if you do so, then every time you interlix a lock with an allocation, then your pipeline of incoming zeroings get stalled for the, the lock. Uh, and so, in fact, you don't get the gain you're looking for. Uh, you get, instead of, um, uh, you, instead of getting the bandwidth covering issue you're looking for, which really is you stall the CPU so you don't actually make progress as fast as you were before, your bandwidth goes down because you're not making progress. Um, so we have this funny thing where here's a write to memory. It's going to zero some lines in your cache, and that's outside your coherency domain. And you have to do something special about it, and the hard software does all these games around using cache line zero uh, in sort of a speculative way, um, knowing that he's going to get some zeros in, but if he has to abort and retry a, a hardware transactional memory attempt or something, the zeroing in memory is going to be different. GC barriers for read and write barriers. That's a big ticket item. Um, people who do uh, academic papers on read barriers uh, typically report slowdowns in between the 10 to 20 percent range. Um, and for us, then, a GC barrier is essentially free now. It's not quite free, but it's very close to free. That, by the way, I'll talk more about when I get to GC. That, about, that read barrier allows us to change GC algorithms to one which scales to insanely high levels and works really, really well. Stack lifetime, uh, another you know, fancy write barrier detection thing, um, the predicted virtual call for doing your um, type subchecking on objects on virtual calls, all done where you do detection in the hardware. And in the software, you do all the complex fix-up logic. So there's no register rollbacks on hardware transactional memory, for instance. Um, some of the other, most of the other academic papers uh, expect you to have an uh, out-of-order uh, engine in your hardware, which means you have all this register renaming gear so you can do speculative register updates and then blow them back and re-roll them and retry them in your hardware. And we don't have that fancy hardware, but we don't need it either. So we don't have a register rollback on our hardware memory failure. It's all done entirely in software. Um, Relocating objects for GC, the software inline cache means we don't need a branch target buffer or jitting, so we don't need the fancy piece of hardware to do direct bytecode execution and so on and so on and so on. So complicated stuff you do in software, simple stuff is usually detection ends up going on in hardware. Okay, other games. Um, no way customers buy funny new hardware from an unknown company and a funny OS they have to support as well. So we have a plug and play thingy. It goes in your data center, you install our JDK, and, uh, and you point your Java program at the new JDK, and boom, it runs. Uh, and literally, it's 10 minutes from install to sort of a max score JBB on any old machine in your entire data center. Um, that was a big ticket item for us in terms of uh, uh, getting in the door at a lot of very conservative bank-like companies, right? We can speed up older Sun and HP gear just in situ. You install a JDK on your old Sun box, was running a Spark thingy, you liked how that was stable and working, just too slow, poof, suddenly it's a thousand times faster. Um, also, you get to avoid all the user visible OS business that leads to, you know, DLL hell or patch hell, right? There's no device drivers, there's no legacy crud, there's no swap, we don't have any swap on the box. 
It's entirely stateless. Um, there's no big kernel lock issues if we picked up Linux. Uh, our scheduler was definitely is a custom scheduler. We've got hundreds of CPUs, thousands of runnables. Uh, most schedulers on the planet have never even remotely come close to dealing with that size, scale of thing. So lots of games you play there to make that run well. Okay. A bunch of other stuff in the OS. Uh, hard performance guarantees. So you can guarantee individual processor processes have a required amount of either memory or CPU or things like that, so they get a, a, a guaranteed lower bound level of performance. But the box is big in terms of the number of JVMs on it, so they, you know, there's a lot of sharing going on. But you can sort your processes by priority and guarantee that the important ones get what they need when they need it. But if they're not using it, then all the other jobs are sort of best effort can pick up the extra memory to make their GC more efficient or extra CPU to run faster or whatever. A bunch of other stuff. The GC requires uh, bulk fast TLB mappings and remappings and shoot down, bulk fast virtual to physical mappings. These are not available on any other OS on the planet, so we had to do a bunch of work there. Um, we do have virtual memory support uh, because, you know, VMs crash, so you don't want one crash to bring your whole box down. Uh, we have people ask it all the time. You, why do you need uh, TLBs if you got uh, you know, strong type safety um, answer as well. You got bugs. Okay, so other robustness things. You got ECC in your caches. You got chip kill. A lot of error reporting stuff. The OS can de deconfigure dead CPUs, dead caches, dead uh, dead memory chips, and stuff like that. So we have our own OS. Um, why do we do our own CPU? Interesting question. Well, um, we can't find a multi-core 64-bit CPU with you know with the designs for sale. Actually, we couldn't find one at all. We had all the features we wanted. Um, you have to have ECC on your L1. Turns out you want parity at least something on your register file because you got so many of them. You got 32 registers that are architecturally visible, 64 actual hardware registers per core. You got 54 cores. You're talking thousands of registers. You get a single bit error. You're going to be, you know, you want to find out about it. You want to, you want to fix it or do something. So, we had parity on the register file. Uh, we need metadata stripping in the load store barriers. We need to redesign the load store barriers to deal with hardware uh, load store unit to deal with hardware transactional memory, to deal with ECC and the L1 cache, to deal with the weak memory model required for scaling. And by that time, you're now redesigning about half your CPU anyhow. So we could have picked up, you know, an x86 uh, uh, implementation, you know, and chip layout, and then gone after the L1, the load store unit, L1 cache unit on the x86. But that would have been just this disaster for, you know, how much the CPU you have to redesign. And other issues are like, you know, you get a nice high quality port of GCC and the tool chain, all that, but that's only like a nice to have. We totally can do our own port to any target hotspots, entirely portable. So we ported GCC to our own chip, and we ported hotspot to our own chip, and those didn't take all that long to go port. So we have our own CPU, our own OS, our own interconnect, all that stuff, because we couldn't get it elsewhere. Okay, what else can we do with all these cores? Well, anything we do on another thread is essentially free because we've got more CPUs than we know what to do with, right? So we have big compiler thread pools, for instance, that jit furiously in the background. When your big application starts, it's common to get 30, 40, 50 compiler threads compiling, get megabytes a second of high-quality jitted code with profiling pouring into your code cache, and after a couple minutes, it's all done, and your whole program's been compiled for you on the fly while you're watching it come up, right? Obvious background GC. We do this giant GC thing. We have, like... Uh, sort of orders of magnitude better GC than anyone else on the planet. Um, and we do this by having all those uh, GC threads do their work in the background on other threads, on other L2s, because a standard operation for GC is to go touch every element of the heap, and this has some really bad locality. You get you scattergun all over the heap. If you're running the GC on the same multi-core chip, same shared cache, uh, then the GC thread... Uh, thrashes the cache that's shared, and the mutators, the actual Java threads doing work, all slow down because they're effectively, their lowest level cache is being trashed by the GC thread. So we run them all on a different L2 cluster. There's no speed race for GC. They just have to get done before the next GC cycle is done, so they have lots of time. So the fact they're essentially running without an L2 cache is all fine. They got an L2 cache, it just happens to miss every time you go to it. Um, and you can do prefetching in GC. I say easy. It's uh, it's actually really pain in the neck, but it's doable. The other fun games you can do, you know, background profiling, uh, pre-zeroing pages, uh, CPUs, hot spin on I/O. So it's you know it's 
clock cycle times between when data arrives in memory and when you start processing and doing stuff with it. Um, it's very, very quick there. Okay, so having come up with a basic design, we have to go build it. Oh, I guess go design it, something like that. Actually make ideas turn into uh, a net list, turn to a tape, and a TSMC, right? Hire a hardware team. There's a dot bust in progress. Lots of good engineers on the street. We got a lot of good guys. Hire an OS team, hire a VM team. We start porting GCC and Hotspot to the new chip. We write a simulator at the same time. Eventually end up booting the OS on the simulator, and it's actually fast enough to run Hotspot on a fast x86 at about 20 megahertz of the Vega chip ops. So that's fast enough to run big, interesting applications entirely under simulation. Lots of cool tools we built. A data race detector found lots of real data races, both in Hotspot and in the application itself. Get a bunch of cache miss rate, cache layout, visualization tools, trace generators, all kinds of fun stuff. I learned interesting lessons here. Your simulators have to be run on a true multi-CPU machine, or you will not get realistic interleavings that will happen in real life. So when we went from a single CPU x86 to a dual CPU x86, a huge count of new data races appeared, uh, all under simulation, obviously, that had never appeared before, even though the simulator was simulating in a multi-CPU machine. And that was just, you just had to have a real multi-CPU machine in your simulator, or you weren't going to simulate any interesting data races, right? Uh, first chip, Vega 1. 24 cores grouped in three clusters of eight sharing a 1 meg L2. Each core has 16K I and D cache, four-way associative, extra tag bits for the hardware transactional memory, these short cache lines. The, um, the L2 is also four-way. People who can do math can suddenly realize that I've got eight CPUs, each four-way on the D cache and four-way on the I cache, sharing one L2 that's only four-way. So we've heavily oversubscribed the weights on the L2, um, and we're obviously at risk for false sharing where uh, two or more, you know, four CPUs all agree to use the same line in L2, and the fifth CPU wants to use the same line, boots out the first one. And then the eight each all boot each other out, and you get constant misses because everyone's false sharing on the L1s, uh, on the L2, because of the small associativity. So there's a big risk for that but we were at the limits of die size and yield that we could get away with here. This was the biggest chip TSMC had ever done at that time. We did a lot of profiling, a lot of look at traces there to come up with these numbers, but they were obviously pretty much a crapshoot at that time. Um, we did have the support for the full 16 chip interconnect, and the L2 miss is roughly the same cost as going to another L2 or going to memory. So it's you know in your L1, it's in your L2, it's not in your L2, sort of the cost hierarchy for uh, memory accesses. 384 CPUs. We built it and, and it worked. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, CPU is this easy JIT target that I asked for. Classic in order, three address risk, 64-bit CPUs, one hit under miss cache, uh, store buffer, it's not really a store, it's a store latch, it's not really a store buffer. It's only one entry. So it's very simple CPUs. Get our masking of metadata. We have a full FPU per core, although it's a very simple one. There's no separate floating point registers. Uh, no flags, no mode bits, no weird stuff you get on CPUs that have been around for 20 years. Background spill fill register stack to help with fast high speed calling, uh, you know, up and down bushy stack call traces. Special ops do a bunch of simple stuff, make it easier. Array math checks, virtual call things. The read barrier, uh, is a very high frequency operation, so it's crucial to be fast. The write barrier uh, replaces a very bulky thing. It's hard to do all the integer ops fast that you need to do the stack uh, barrier. Although if you're just doing card marks in a write barrier, it, it doesn't save you so much. It saves you some, though. We get our first silicon back from TSMC, about 2004, right? It's not quite dead. <laughs> it's dead, Jim, not quite. Okay, so the L2s are mostly dead. Um, a few L2s can run because they got the ECC and they're endlessly correcting errors. And also we have this one way, we call it the limp home mode, like your transmission, I don't know if you guys know this, but if your transmission dies, it has a limp home mode where you can stuck in first gear and the car will be drivable, although the tranny will have exploded internally. Um, like I said, all, I said, older drivers are nodding their heads. Yeah, I remember this. So these are manufacturing errors of various kinds that we don't know what's going on yet. So at the time we get the chip back, it's just totally a blind. We have a guy at TSMC in Taiwan. He gets on a plane with a box, 
and he shows up in our office 24 hours later, and we, you know, score the chips, break them open, and put them under, uh, uh, you know, put a probes on them, and away we go, right? And, and obviously the first thing that happens is they're dead. <laughs> okay, what's going on? Okay, so, um, but we have this one-way mode. So out of the four ways on your 1 meg L2, you can turn off three of them that are so dead that they're just killing you. And the one-way lives with massive ECC errors, but it's living. So you get a one-way 256K L2, right? Um, you get register writes from the even-numbered registers are bleeding into the odd-numbered registers periodically. That's kind of really ugly thing. So every time you do uh, add Rx plus Ry into register Rz, if Z is even, then sometimes the bits that you wrote in Rz showed up in Rz plus 1. Um, so it's kind of ugly. So, so we jit to a subset of the even subset of registers, right? Although we have other issues like the decoder, the instruction decoder treats branch offset bits as registers and parallel decodes the instruction type as a branch, but also is decoding the register bits out of the instruction. So if you're branching to an even or an odd offset, you get an even or odd register uh, uh, decode, and that cycles the address port for that register piece of the register file, and again, you get these updates to the wrong bits. So you have to branch to even addresses now. That's not exactly even. It's like the fourth bit over or whatever, some random bit that you had to always have zero on a branch. We still get a few good chips out of all this mess, uh, but we have to over-voltage them so, um, so that they'll, so the registers will behave well enough you can run it all. And so the chips have electron migration issues. The, the, the actual bits of silicon are migrating in the matrix and going to the other side. And so the chips are literally cooking to death in about a month. So it's like guys have these chip with all this gear on it and this giant fan right on the chip and, you know, it's howling away on the fan. And, uh, you know, and it's up and it's working and it's doing stuff. And it's running at one third, you know, one third the clock frequency and, and five times the voltage and it's dying. But it's cooking a little bit, right? So we make progress. We get the OS guys to actually get to where they can boot on this sick thing. Um, they actually get a great chance to test all their error correction codes, all their deconfigure, bad CPU codes, all this stuff. They, they got that all working out in the first few months. Um, but we go back to TSMC and say, you know, what happened here? It turns out that actually what happened was uh, a bunch of the silicon IP that we'd purchased from other vendors uh, from the DSP market mostly, uh, had spec'd it internally at their site to run at the frequencies we were looking at, but that was about four, three, well, two or three times the frequencies they had ever actually shipped to a customer at. So in theory, it was supposed to be good at the frequencies we were looking at. In practice, I'd never tried it, and in practice, of course, it didn't work. So we paid for this to work at you know, X frequency, and it wasn't working at that frequency. So they had to come back to us and work with them, and they kind of figured where they'd screwed up, and we had a metal mask spent. So we took the existing wafers, of which about uh, three quarters we had stopped before the last metal layers go on, and had them add a new metal layer. So you add a bunch of new extra wires. Turns out, in all these cool tricks the Harbor guys do, they throw a lot of extra transistors on the chip that no one has a use for. And then if you do a metal mask spin, you get to pick up new transistors that you didn't ever use before or have a need for. So you could just route around. You say, well, instead of running this wire from here to there, I'm going to run it over to here and do this, some of these transistors that I just left lying around for this purpose, and then drag it back over here. And that's how they correct all, all these issues. So they, they do this metal mask spin, correct a bunch of these issues. Um, and it turns out the second silicon is actually pretty darn functional. Uh, there was a minor security uh, fix. Um, uh, I think only us would have ever noticed it, but we spun it for that anyhow. And other than that, uh, you know, Vega 1 was alive. Um, two weeks from getting the silicon to getting the OS to boot, a day later to get Hello World out of a C program, four days later, the Java Dash version works, right? We had a you know, year under simulation, and the simulator hours really paid off here. It still took us a, a year to get the system robust, not just the metal spin thing, so a lot of true data race bugs that just never happened before because no one had ever seen a system this out of order and concurrent before. We got way more CPUs than anyone expects. We got way more out of order allowed than anyone's seen before. All kinds of issues with just true bugs that have to be found there. A lot of performance warts. Uh, I mentioned earlier about having a four-way L2 being overcommitted. Well, it was. We got a lot of conflicts. Heavy L2 miss rate, really bad. A lot of uh, TLB miss rates. Turns out that we can fix nearly all the L2 miss rate issues by doing random offsets on your stacks. It was all the stacks were neatly aligned on one meg boundaries, and they all would charge in to about the same depth in their call tree and scribble up and down furiously at about the same depth in their call tree, all at one meg offsets, which would land politely in the same way in the L2 cache. And so all eight stacks would be fighting for four ways in the L2, causing endless misses uh, with little random offsets, and poof, it was problem solved. Um, we did a little random offset in the code cache, a little page coloring in the OS, 
and a lot of these issues went away, but they certainly started out there. Um, turns out it is okay to have a four-way L2 share eight four-way L1s. Uh, the miss rate's entirely tolerable, uh, but not sort of out of the door. It just took some work to get there. Uh, a bunch of other issues with the virtualization layer. I mentioned we were plug and play. Well, we virtualized the JVM to do that. That wasn't virtual enough. It was showing through. We had to fix a bunch of warts there. Uh, I made a bottle of performance fixes throughout the years to make life run faster and faster. Okay. So what worked out of all of this and what didn't? Um, well, the chip worked after the second metal spin, right? Plenty of bandwidth to go around. <clears throat> Even more CPU cycles, unbelievable number of CPU cycles. Certainly compared to like an x86, we have way more MIPS per chip, MIPS per watt, than an x86, like 5x more. It's unreal more. Um, we eventually got our predicted cash miss rates, or it didn't happen right away. Uh, there were a lot of funny places where we got weird miss rates due to that L2 being low sensitivity before we finally beat it out, uh, you know, figured all the issues and solved them. Um, CPUs remain slower than we'd ever hoped for, and that's just sort of the limit of an in-order, low-frequency CPU um, and not having an uber-huge design team to go do the, the you know, fabulous job you can do on hardware there. Um, there are a lot of hardware features that were not turned on for a long time because we had stability issues in software. We had to get, uh, you know, get the software robust and reliable. You can't sell, to, especially to a bank, until things are pretty rock, darn rock solid. Um, so we have our hands full with basic code gen issues and data races and stuff like that. The hardware guys had their own set of issues for about a year. Le weird low-frequency DRAM bugs. A lot of them were masked by ECC, where the hardware had a real bug, but the, the ECC was continu continuously correcting it. Um, and they eventually found out and fixed all these issues, um, but it did take a while. The motherboard had to go through quite a few iterations to get a lot of the timing issues out with the DRAMs. Um, we can't get a power supply, it's as reliable as claimed. That was kind of surprising. I thought power supply would be a done deal. We want, you know, 2,500 watt power supply, you go to one of these big power supply vendor guys, Fujitsu, whoever. We had a bunch of people, you know, sell such things and go through a specking process with us and bid and ship us models, and then they would just die in the lab straight up. You, here's this new 2,500 watt power, so you put a 2,500 watt load on it, thunk, and it die. So, what the heck? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, what do you do? Uh, ah. So um, that went round and round a while before we got that squared away. Um, we had a bunch of scheduling problems in the OS. Um, it's hard to schedule 800 CPUs. It's just not a, it's not a plug and play solution kind of thing. A uh, bunch of IO stack issues having to do with virtualization of the IO stack. So it's not just virtualization, it's efficient virtualization of the IO stack. That's hard. Read barriers. Um, every time we get a new integration from Sun, there are new unbarriered loads because Sun doesn't use read barriers in their implementation. So we have to go find them all and fix them. And of course, not having a read barrier caused some very low frequency, hard to debug GC issue that takes forever to track down. Um, it turns out that our GC, certainly the first cut of it was a single generation only. It would do a full GC cycle every time it did a GC cycle. Now, a GC cycle at that time would cost you oh, 100 millisecond pause, no matter how big your heap was, for hundreds of gigabytes of heap. Uh, but we do it every five seconds. So if you look at Sun's code, if you take a full GC cycle, and they do some stuff during a full GC cycle, they don't do it any other time, and they would normally, in the course of a business day, do a full GC cycle about once a day. We're doing about one about once every five seconds. So we found lots of bugs in the full GC cycle behavior that were related to the fact that it would only happen on a full GC cycle because we're doing it so much more often. So these days, we're generational on the GC. It's more efficient, but you still get a GC cycle every five seconds of some kind. Okay, a lot of internal engineering debates raging on over, should we work on stability? Should we turn on hardware transaction memory? Should we turn on stack allocation uh, escape detection thing? How about bigger thread pools for faster startup time, get your jitting code jitted faster? Tiered compilation, generational GC, read the list, it goes on. <clears throat> um, turns out that uh, hardware transactional memory support and the stack allocation, the escape detection bits, both lose for a while, just out of engineering man hours. They're hard problems to get right. takes a while to diagnose and fix it. We have a lot of other issues we're debating, uh, like engineers helping with sale calls because the customers have code that is not correct, but it's happening to work okay on their x86, so they die once a day in production, and they get in an Azul box and dies every 10 minutes. And so now you can't get a sales through because you know, your application can't run 10 minutes or it falls over, right? You get a lot of true data races in their own buggy code that they weren't aware of, or they knew they were there, they just couldn't find them. 
The HTM itself, the performance of it was buggy for quite a while, mostly caught in essentially live lock where you would attempt to transact through a lock and that would fail for whatever reason. And so you would try again. You'd make no forward progress, endlessly failing. It's essentially live lock, fail, 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 fail. Eventually you track those down uh, and, and, and flip over to the OS lock. Um, but you have to, after you track it, you know, trap, fail out to the OS lock, and go ahead and proceed through the lock and make progress. Periodically, you have to go back and retry the HTM because there's a lot of startup conditions for which the HTM is just going to fail and there's no point to doing it until the system sort of hits steady state. And then you can start trying the hardware transactional memory again. And if it works, you can sort of bump the steady state up as you go and you can get higher and higher throughput issues out, right? At this point, it's been on, uh, turned on by default, been shipping for three years now. Uh, it, it rarely helps customers for, like I said, it's most in another talk. It never hurts. Um, and occasionally you get a big win, so you get a 2x speed up or something. But the usual case is there's nothing. We, we always transact uh, a couple dozen locks. It's never enough locks that they can actually get more throughput out of the box. Uh, and it's because of other issues that they can't get throughput out. Either, either the, you can't transact the locks that you need to because of true data dependencies, or else it's not locking as the scaling limit. It's the network's not fast enough, the DB's not fast enough, whatever it is, right? Stack allocation has more issues. The good case is really good. Big, busy app servers can have a huge percentage of objects stack allocated, but the bad cases are really bad, and we just ran out of time to go get the bad cases all squared away, and our standard GC is really good. These days, our standard GC is, um, we'll do three, and we have customers with 300 gigabyte heaps in production. Three to 400, 500 gigabyte heaps, um, with uh, 35 uh, gigabytes a second allocation rates with max pause times in the low tens, like 10 to 15 milliseconds. So that's you know, day in, day out, running continuously. So this is several orders of magnitude better than the best you can get on, a, on an x86 these days. So we don't have any drive to fix the bad cases, so stack allocation just lost. <clears throat> Oh, okay, here it is. GC works really well now. Um, first time in a new customer, it's really common to do this. You install the gear, you take their current command line launch, strip out all their old GC orgs, double the default heap size they were running with, and run again, and they never have a GC problem ever again. Now, GC is probably, and double is probably too much. You dial it back, you trade off CPUs for GC at some point down the road. You solve all the other problems before you get into a sales job and let the customers do the dial back and figure out the right trade off between uh, CPU and memory there. It's, it's a combination. There's all these great tuning flags that don't make any sense on our GC at all. Right. And in fact, we have no tuning flags at all on the GC. If it doesn't perform well, that's a bug for us. We go fix it on whatever your app is, whatever shape GC cycle thing it's doing. Um, so yeah, there's some combination there. Doubling the default heap size removes a lot of corner case issues people wedge themselves into that they've pushed themselves up to the limit. And then they did all these things to try to preserve uh, heap space that are kind of ugly internally uh, because they can't get a bigger heap because the GC pauses kill them. And so as soon as you like uncork the GC limit, like a lot of things can be like their caches are all too small because they can't have a big cache because their heap's too big, right? So as soon as you say, okay, double the heap size, well, immediately they, they grow all their caches. Well, okay, now everything's the cache works well. <laughs> so they've made a bunch of progress there, right? So there's a bunch of stuff going on there. Well, um, we have this really cool internal profiling tool. Um, has a horrible name. Um, customers who first saw it, like, totally demanded it. It's like, oh, I got to have this thing. We got to give it to us now. It's like, okay, fine, we'll give it to you. And then it's now it's a major selling point. Um, we get to see the guts of a running JVM, of every running JVM. It's like an always a long profiling tool. You attach it with a browser on a VM that's been running for a month in production, and it will tell you everything you can ever hope to and want to know about a VM, you know, right now as it's running. Um, so, like I said, it's always on. You get thread stacks. You get GC cycles, feeds and feeds. You can surf the heap. You can look at all your hot locks and all the callback stack traces. You get, you know, caller, callee saves profiling data. Always available, always on. Just plug it and look at it and, and figure out what's happening. So that's one of these deals where um, you know, the, the, the VM's been up in production for a week, and there's some load spike hit, and throughput on the VM drops you know, down the toilet. And I, what the heck happened? I can't repro this ever in QA because I can't ever get a weak run followed by the right set of magic conditions to make it fail. So, but now I can. I mean, I don't, now I don't care. I pull this thing out and, oh, what's going on? Okay, now I can see. Um, chips OS, they're solid now. 
Um, we have over a year uptimes on some systems. The standard engineering box that I do daily work on at Azul now goes down when we have power failures, and that's it. Um, the last time it went down hard was uh, Google chopped our, um, our chilled water line to our data center. <clears throat> I guess it went down. <laughs> Wash your chips. Yes, okay. Oh, here's our TPM. Okay, I do have a slide on this. Yeah, yeah, number two feature behind the GC and the stable performance under load thing, right? Live peak into any JVM with any web browser, always on, no overhead, all this kind of cool stuff. When you say live thread, that means it actually, like, I, 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 change? Yes, like, yes. Like, you get a snapshot, and you hit refresh in the browser, you get the new snapshot of the new stack, and it's run on for however many seconds, and then here's the new stack. Oh, okay, Snap. it doesn't, doesn't play. Um, well, no, you can get them as fast as your browser can refresh, okay. right? But, of course, you're going to get, no, no, no. It's not actually like being notified whenever, whenever it's accurate. You couldn't keep up, well, obviously. No, no, no. Every time you ask, it's a pull model. You ask, you get a new stack, right? It's what the stack is right now. Okay. Um, well, we also have all, like, network stuff in there. I mentioned that. It's like net stats on in the VM. We know all your sockets that are open, how much I.O. is going through them, and what's it doing, where it's going. That kind of stuff. Okay, rolling along. Yeah, Vega 2 came out a couple years ago. 48 CPUs per core, higher clock rate, faster memory bus, um, some tweaks to the hardware. The read barrier had to be changed to support generational GC. We dropped some less used instructions so we're not binary compatible from generation to generation. We also changed like the encoding layout for convenience for the, uh, the guys doing decoding. So that was an instruction change, but the binary bits were different for that piece. But we actually dropped some instructions and added some others. 2008, we're now shipping Vega 3. It's 54 cores. Actually, we had nine cores per cluster in Vega 2, but we had reserved them for uh, yield issues. So of the nine on a core, we would look, and if there was one dead, we would whack it out with an ion beam, you know, mask out game. And then you have eight, uh, and then you get a good ship where all uh, 48 CPUs were available, right? Uh, by Vega 3, the yield is so high that we just said, oh, we'll just keep a 9 as 9. Bigger cache, higher clock rate, uh, generational GC, better support for profiling, better HTM. Now we're working on fourth generation, which I can't talk much about. Let's see what else is in there. Okay, some lessons learned. Some fun stuff here, right? If you own the whole stack, hardware and up, you can do progress, even with some really awful hardware bugs, right? <clears throat> we worked around some ridiculous things in software. Um, some of them, we never bothered to fix in hardware. We just fixed in software and we're done. Um, some really hard hardware problems, like running out of bandwidth is a hard hardware problem. We fixed, well, we improved hugely by using CLZ to cut our bandwidth by a third. That was a big ticket item. The hardware guys were like, you know, we can give you X bandwidth, and all our predictions say that's going to be marginal. And we said, okay, we cut a third off, and suddenly you're in the sweet spot, right? GC, I'll claim it's solved. Well, at least it's solved in a certain domain of the... Small to very large, but not the microscopic. Not hard real time, although it's getting closer. Um, or at least we can handle something that's quite a bit larger than anything I've ever seen anyone else handle by, you know, by two orders of magnitude. Um, we can do lock collision with some very simple hardware transactional memory, and it doesn't really help. It's very sad. We might be able to get some help doing like NCAS and algorithms for people who like Dougley who are going to write concurrent algorithms doing very specific things where an NCAS is going to let them do some fancy trick they can't do any other way, but it's not going to be like it shows up in your everyday programming work. You can't just call out to an HTM and have it do something useful for you. Blah. Okay, huge counts of simple cores has turned out to be useful in production. That was kind of surprising. I wasn't quite sure if that was true or not. Um, it, no question we'd rather have faster cores but we can get away with simple cores and loads of them and do uh, jobs that you can't ever do on an x86. And that is probably it. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll take, take questions. Okay. Okay, so a lot of the features, the question is something like a lot of the features here resolve, revolve around GC and wouldn't it be feasible for Intel to do something along those lines? And the answer is, is that we have talked a lot with Intel 
and it's like moving the Titanic, you know. <laughs> it doesn't matter how hard you push, it's just, it's just like a millimeters at a time. Um, I don't know what it would take to get them to move. It's like, for Intel not to do a read barrier is like an obvious crying shame and a waste of like huge market potential for them to suddenly own the whole Java server market, right? Nobody. For Sun not to have done it should have been criminal offense on their, their, their stockholders should have sent their, you know, exec staff to jail for being like, you know, after we did it and said, oh, look at what we can do, that they didn't immediately announce that we're doing it on our next chip was just like criminal. What the heck? Uh, yeah, well. Okay, fine. And at Sun, they have no excuse. Okay, fine. Yes. So the answer is totally Intel could do this. And totally we've attempted. Um, and I can't say more about where that's at other than to say I'm frustrated. Well, it wouldn't just be Java. It would also be C-sharp and JavaScript. As Jeremy points out, it's not just Java that would get helped here. Everyone doing a managed runtime with garbage collection would get helped here. Seems like an obvious win from all parties. No. No. From our customer's point of view, okay, I mentioned binary compatibility. Do we ship GCC? The answer is we do not ship GCC. We are not binary compatible. Our binary compatibility layer, if you will, is Java bytecodes, and we're compatible at that sense, but not in any other way. Yeah, yeah, to illustrate the fact that we, we've gotten rid of the binary compatibility bugaboo that bytes Intel by switching to Java bytecodes as the binary compatibility layer. Uh, the read barrier, how do you mitigate the cost of traps? Yeah, in the read barrier, how do we negate the cost of traps? Okay, so um, so the sort of the issue is uh, we do and we don't, and it doesn't matter all, all together at the same time. <laughs> um, the, we have in the hardware support uh, support for fast user mode traps. So when I say fast user mode trap, when the read barrier traps, essentially you get a function call to a fixed address. It takes about four clocks to get things set up, and you're in the function call, and a return takes you back to where you were, and you re-execute. Well, you, you return to the following instruction. You have to dork the return PC if you want to re-execute the instruction that faulted, which would be the read barrier op that faulted. Okay, fine. So that's cheap in the sense that it's actually, there's no kernel hopping. We, the kernel's not involved here at all. Um, then uh, the algorithm, the way the algorithm works, when you update the faulting value, which is a value in a register, you also update the value that fel faulted in memory. So the next time you load it, you won't trap. So there's a, a sort of a self-healing property here. As, you, as a mutator works through his uh, working set, he cleans out the, the pointers that are in front of him, that are in his way, as he goes, at a cost of you know, 40, 50 clock cycles per fail. So at a GC uh, phase flip boundary, when you flip the magic bit on what's correct and what false, um, the mutators all throw up uh, a few hundred traps before they get their working set. And the GC threads all furiously charge ahead of the mutators over what they hope is the mutator's working set, flipping bits ahead of the mutators. And in practice, after a few hundred traps, uh, they, they quit trapping. You know, they have a very steep tail off, and then they get occasional traps way out there, but you know, mostly they quit trapping. So the cost of a phase flip, the trap storm that happens on a phase flip, is so small that we have trouble measuring it with good hardware performance counter implementations. So it's got to be there. We know the exact count of traps. It's too few to matter. Yeah, how do we, okay, with all the cores and threads, how do we mitigate the stop of, uh, the cost of stopping all of them? Okay, so the first thing is, is that um, uh, GC cycle pauses come uh, every few minutes, and then uh, we do cooperative self-preemption uh, as a means to stopping them. So, so most of the GC pauses, most of the GC cycle phase flip things you would think about, we do with a ragged barrier. Uh, in that case, um, each individual core uh, passes some line in the sand, he crawls his own stack, which is hot in his cache, he does some GC thing, he announces to everyone else he's done it, and he carries on. When everyone announces that they've all done it, you're done with that phase. No one CPU has ever been halted except to do a stack crawl and verify that his stack was, you know, pretty looking, though, however we wanted it done. Uh, there are uh, a couple times a minute where you, uh, points you have to stop everybody, and so there, 
you can't start the GC issue until the last guy checks in, right? So the, the longest pause is the first guy quits going to the last guy checks in, then you do your GC thing and you let them all go. Um, and a cooperative self preemption, what we do is we first announce to all threads that we want them to come to a safe point as soon as they can. And, uh, and on the flip side, threads that are knowing that they're going to go do some sort of blocking operation, including getting preempted out of the process, all come to safe point first. So the only guys who are running are the guys who are actually on the CPUs running. Everyone else is at a safe point. So you cut the thousands down to hundreds, is however many CPUs you're actually running. Then the hundreds all first attempt to cooperatively. Uh, uh, safe point while the GC guys are trying individually to shoot down the non-cooperative guys. So they have a, we call it a, you know, night of the living dead kind of race where each guy that checks in now goes and helps the next guy check in kind of thing. So it's a log tree effect and they all pull to a halt. Uh, in practice, um, it's usually a handful of milliseconds to drag everyone to a halt uh, when you have hundreds of running threads. If you have tens of running threads, it's usually microseconds to get them all to a halt. Um, uh, it's uh, at the hardware level, the, the chips have a, have a bit per core that says that when you pass an instruction that contains uh, of the appropriate flavor, you'll, halt, you'll trap instead of fast user mode trap instead of executing. Uh, it's like a couple branch instructions, so backwards branches do it. Places you put safe points in, the test for this is done by running a single instruction. Uh, so you go to make it happen, you go to the OS and you say, please tell all the CPUs to save point themselves. And the OS uh, uh, replicates a message throughout all the cores saying, light up all the bits on all these cores. And then, then the cores all start checking in. Um, so that's all done in microseconds. You get into the OS and have them light up all the chips. And then they, all the threads start lighting, coming back in at you. So there's some hardware support there. Yeah. No. The, the GC was so good that no one uh, that we never got around to doing uh, the the um, the hardware the stack the stack escape analysis uh, stack allocation support. As far as I know, and then the question is, has anyone else done that? As far as I know, no one has gone ahead and attempted to do escape detection at a so pure software level just to see how it would work. Although I've proposed it to a number of people, I haven't seen any literature suggesting it's been attempted. Uh, it seems obvious to me that it should work well. You can do that kind of escape. Uh, we did a pretty aggressive one in hardware because we could. You could do a simpler one that wouldn't be quite as pretty uh, in software and a handful of instructions. Uh, and that would probably be good enough to hit the 50% mark, um, which would be a big win for a lot of these big heaps. Throw up his hands. <laughs> uh, so, <coughs> what's the cost model? Yeah. So, the question is, what is the cost model for a volatile read versus a volatile write? So, you know, to be honest, you have to code to the x86 platform. And what's the cost model of a volatile read versus a volatile write on an x86? And everyone else just live with whatever you do. Okay. So and under the x86, a volatile read, I believe, is almost the same as a, essentially as a plain old read. And a volatile write has an extra fence. The extra fence is a cache miss, which on an x86 is like 1,000 clocks worth of issues that didn't happen or something horrible. It's you know, 300 clocks times four white issue or something ridiculous. 1,000 ops that didn't happen. So you should always favor volatile reads, just period. Um, but that might make it And, and you know, to be fair, that's that's our problem. <laughs> now, having said that, uh, for us, uh, no, in GC, all GC issues that don't work are yeah, are bugs. Yeah, right. Um, for for us, uh, reads or writes that don't contend with other threads are one clock either way. So if you do volatile reads or volatile writes, there's a clock for the read or the write. There's a clock more for the fence. The fence is just one clock if you're not and actually got 
contention going on. And if you've got contention going on, uh, you probably don't have an algorithm that scales to hundreds of CPUs unless you're, you know, you've been on one of our boxes. So it doesn't matter. You're not going to scale with doodly anyhow. <laughs> and that's just the case. That's the way it goes. You know, Doug's happy when he goes to 64, but then I beat on him and say, no, 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 do this, and it goes to hundreds. And I have algorithms that do go to hundreds, go to you know, full out 864. So it can be done. It's just it's not it's not a straightforward operation. So, you know, if Doug's not going to do it, I'm not expecting your average guy to do it. So you favor reads. Yeah, so how much trouble do we have? So the usual story, the way it kind of goes, is uh, the first time you get into a customer's site, uh, it's always an, oh, my God, save my bacon kind of thing. And they already have their best people on it, and they're stuck. So you have really sharp guys, and you show them what's going on, you explain how it works, you show them the RTPM stuff, and they get it. Uh, and then they go after it, and they, you know, RTPM gives them the tool they've been missing for years and years, and they tear after their own code, and lo and behold, it happens. They get the performance out. Um, sometimes there's a couple rounds of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, lecture by me or by somebody else doing how to write scalable code, why this or that or whatever, but not much, and then the smart guys go to town, and they make it work. Uh, after it's been in the customer's hands for a while, uh, that knowledge spreads out to more and more people. And then they get apps that they try testing on your gear. And when it doesn't work, they go to talk to their in-house expert. And, uh, and they figure out what's going on. So we've gradually seen uh, an uplifting level of education in the market as a whole of why it's, what's scalable and what's not, and what's a bottleneck and what's not, and why, and how it all works. So things are improving slowly. And Google's pushing at it as well in your own way. You have... Uh, different. You have distributed memory, but you have the, the scalable issue, and so I'm sure you have to educate every new programmer who comes in the door. But then some of them walk out and talk to other people, and, and so there's some level of education going there. Yes, sir? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> Do you eat like this? Is that... Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, we've gone back and forth on this. Uh, mostly, we don't want to support... Uh, we don't want to hand out the level of support. The, we don't have enough engineers to handle the level of support the, the, the universities want. Like, we don't want to handle the tool chain and then have to help the university guys figure out what they screwed up. So to do it, we have to really hand them a box and say, if you run Java, we'll honor the contract on maintenance and guarantees and it works. And if you run anything else, well, then it's just your problem. And, uh, and that's been a harder, you know, harder job to go after. Having said that, uh, we do have a number of uh, people who... Uh, are uh, putting out for government grants for boxes, and um, we do do academic uh, licenses where you can log in remotely on a Zool box, which Doug does, but so do like Nir Shavitz guys, uh, Maris Hurley's grad students log in pretty routinely and run big parallel weird ep uh, you know, algorithms. But they run it in Java bytecodes. Oh, it's Windows. So uh, we set a hardware has uh, register spill fill. Uh, yeah, it's variable sized Windows done in the hardware. So you have two stacks? Yeah, it's two stacks. You have a register stack and a regular sort of C execution stack. It's just to make function calls faster. And because it's variable size, you don't have the spark issue of a recursion blowing your stack out by forcing whatever. So how big is the register total? I, I believe uh, in the Vega 3, it ended up at 64. Um, which, given the spill fill rate, was plenty good enough. Like, you know, look at the instruction traces, um, sorry, look at the hardware level traces of where the cycles go. It's much less than 1% go in the register spill fill engine. Like, I have no desire to speed that guy up, right? It's not, that's not where my time goes. Uh, yeah, in Vega 3, it's two instead of one. It turns out that that's fine. And that's because uh, you don't stall for rights to the lines that you're immediately allocating because uh, you've pre-zeroed them in your L1 and they've arrived just in time and so they're all hot in your L1. So all your new allocation objects, uh, you don't do the zeroing rights in the first place, so it's just less rights. And you also don't have to wait for them to come in. So you don't need a big store buffer to handle the cache miss. So on an x86, you want a big store buffer because you're going to get a cache miss. He predicts some of the time and brings that line in, or they have to do a read and make it coherent and does the bandwidth cost. Uh, but it's not always. So 
He, he wants to be able to eat an entire cache line's worth of writes, and probably actually several cache line's worth of writes, because that's how far you're going to get behind if he gets behind there, right? I know Spark has a giant write buffer, and they, they did it because they're running Java code for which what they would, what would happen to them would be uh, uh, people, you know, do a bunch of writes in a row to, out to zero out new objects, and there weren't in their cache, and so suddenly they had to eat those writes or stall, so they put a giant write buffer in. Yeah. Um, so the question is, you know, what's the collector style? Uh, is it a copying collector or what? Um, there are phase flips. It's uh, there's a VEE 2005 paper that describes the algorithm in a lot more detail. Yeah, pauseless GC paper. So it's a it's a copying collector. We copy every cycle. We copy the whole heap every cycle and compact. Uh, wastage in what way? What? Extra what? Extra CPUs? We always got extra yeah, CPUs. So the, the, the extra, since you're using your heap as part of your mark stack, it's really costing you slightly more than you um, uh, Apparently, the GC guys never seem to mind or care or anything. There's no issue there. Uh, one of the games that goes on is that we don't have to run the heap so close to the out of memory state that other collectors end up getting because of the pause issue. So um, we typically have a sort of a generous slop extra on the heap, and then that eases a lot of GC pressures. But when you run the box down uh, to tighter and tighter memory limits, GC cycles faster and faster. It's burned CPU, but it will comfortably run at you know, 10 20% over live heap. Uh, you'll just be burning a lot of CPU to do it. It's, just, it's not necessarily where you want to set yourself. <laughs>